U.S. President Joe Biden tried to jumpstart his nation's relationship with African countries on Wednesday after years where the continent was less of a priority and China made inroads with big investments in trade. The United States is all in on Africa's future because when Africa succeeds, the United States succeeds. Quite frankly, the whole world succeeds as well. His remarks at a three-day summit with African leaders aimed to set the U.S. up as a major partner, even as China's trade with the continent dwarfs America's four times over. On Wednesday, Biden listed U.S. firms announcing deals at the summit, including GE and Cisco. And during a White House dinner, Biden addressed what he called America's original sin, the enslavement of millions, and honored their descendants and the broader African diaspora. Our people lie at the heart of the deep and profound connection that forever binds Africa and the United States together. We remember the stolen men and women and children who were brought to our shores in chains, subjected to unimaginable cruelty. Beijing has held its own high-level meetings with African leaders every three years for over two decades, whereas this week's U.S. summit is the first of its kind with African nations since 2014 under President Barack Obama. As part of it, Biden promised $55 billion for African food security, climate change, and more. He's also expected to back the African Union's admission to the G20 during Thursday's summit events. Biden did not mention China on Wednesday, and U.S. officials have been reluctant to frame the gathering as a battle for influence. Washington has also dialed back criticism of Beijing's lending practices and big infrastructure projects around the globe. Ahead of the summit, China's foreign ministry said that its interests in Africa were based on, quote, sincerity, and that Beijing is opposed to treating the continent as an arena for great powers to compete with each other. Africa is facing a food crisis that is bigger and more complex than it has ever seen before. That's according to diplomats and aid workers who say the situation has worsened in the past year. Conflict and climate change are the main culprits. <laughs> Nadifa Abdi Isak had to bring her malnourished daughters to a hospital in Mogadishu. She and her family set off on foot to the capital in hopes of escaping the drought that ravaged their town. The journey took 12 days. She says three of her children were anemic and needed blood transfusions. A nurse told her 42 other children had already been checked into the emergency unit that day from hunger. There were 57 the day before that. Half a million children's lives are at risk from a looming famine in Somalia, according to the UN, more than anywhere else in the world. It also says one in five Africans, a record 278 million people, were already facing hunger in 2021, but warns the peak of the hunger crisis hasn't been seen yet. East Africa has missed four consecutive rainy seasons, the worst drought in decades. While on the other side of the continent, West Africa has been hit by flooding after historic rainfall. Heavy debt burdens following the COVID-19 pandemic continue to affect livelihoods, while rising prices and the war in Ukraine have made things worse. Regional Director of UNICEF, Rania Degash. The fundamental issue in Somalia and in the Horn at the moment is a climate-induced crisis, right? It's drought. But where the effects of the Ukraine crisis come in is that the food prices and fuel prices and others um, are hiked up to a point where we need more resources to secure what we would have secured before. We need a lot more. Conflicts are also worsening across the continent. It's long been a driver of hunger, forcing people from their homes, livelihoods and farms, while making it dangerous to deliver assistance. The number of displaced people in Africa has tripled over the past decade to a record 36 million in 2022, according to the UN. That represents almost half the displaced people in the world. After a week of violent protests following the ouster of former President Pedro Castillo, Peru's defense minister on Wednesday announced a nationwide state of emergency.
The 30-day declaration grants new powers to the military, allowing soldiers to assist police, and could mean the suspension of certain freedoms, including the right to assembly. The mass demonstrations erupted after Castillo was impeached on December 7th and arrested after illegally trying to dissolve the Andean nation's Congress. He was charged with rebellion and conspiracy, and Castillo's former vice president, Dina Boluarte, was sworn into office. Protesters have blockaded highways, set fires to buildings, and invaded airports. According to authorities, six people have died in clashes with the police. Meanwhile, prosecutors said they were seeking 18 months of pretrial detention for Castillo. Peru's Supreme Court met to consider the request, but later suspended the session until Thursday. Supporters say Castillo is being mistreated. Pedro Castillo should have been released today. Today marks the seventh day of his preliminary detention. He should have been released at 1.30 p.m., but yesterday at midnight, the prosecutor asked for 18 months of preliminary prison for Castillo. Right now, the president has no lawyers. We need international help, please. Boluarte, speaking to reporters from the presidential palace, called for peace and said, quote, we can't have dialogue if there's violence between us, adding that elections could be moved forward to December 2023 from April 2024, a date she had pledged earlier. The vote is currently slated for 2026 when Castillo's term would have ended. Castillo has gained support from fellow regional leftist leaders, including Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador, who criticized his removal as undemocratic. U.S. stocks ended lower in volatile trading on Wednesday after the Federal Reserve raised interest rates by an expected 50 basis points, but also said it sees higher rates for a longer period of time. The Dow fell less than half a percent, the S&P 500 ended down six-tenths of a percent, while the Nasdaq closed three-quarters of a percent lower. At a press conference, Fed Chair Jerome Powell said it was too soon to talk about cutting rates. We will stay the course until the job is done. Jason Ray is founder and CEO of Zenith Wealth Partners. The Fed today raised rates by 50 basis points, and Fed officials signaled that the federal funds rate will rise to 5.1 percent next year. However, seven policymakers saw the rate eclipsing 5.25 percent in 2023, uh, which is a lot higher than investors had priced in for the February meeting of only 25 basis points. So this represents a material increase in what investors expected coming out of the Fed meeting today. Tesla CEO Elon Musk expressed frustration with the Fed's rate hikes as shares of the interest rate sensitive stock have plummeted in recent days. Shares slipped another two and a half percent on Wednesday after a Goldman Sachs analyst cut the price target on the stock. Charter communications tumbled after brokerages cut their price targets following the firm's mega spending plans for a higher speed Internet upgrade. But shares of social media firms Meta Platforms and Snap came out of Wednesday's turbulence with gains of at least a percent. And shares of Moderna marked a second day of big gains on a promising study for a skin cancer vaccine. This satellite can tell us how much water is flowing through all of the Earth's rivers into the ocean, all the way from space. NASA is launching an international satellite mission that will conduct the first global survey of the world's surface waters, helping shed new light on the mechanics and consequences of climate change. Hey, look, I can tell you for any big river system in the world, I can tell you how much water is coming out of that right now. And we're doing that from a satellite. I mean, how, that's just fundamentally really cool. The satellite is dubbed SWAT, short for Surface Water and Ocean Topography. It was designed and built at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, near Los Angeles, in collaboration with NASA's counterparts in France and Canada. The satellite employs advanced microwave radar technology to give scientists an unprecedented view of the life-giving fluid covering 70% of the planet. Researchers say the data will enhance ocean circulation models bolster weather and climate forecasts, and help manage scarce freshwater supplies in drought-stricken regions. NASA's SWAT freshwater science lead, Tamlin Pawelski, explains. So the big difference with SWAT is we're going to take this sort of static estimate 
where we can say, ah, eh, you know, this is probably about how much water there is total in the world's lakes. And we're going to be able to make that, first of all, dynamic. We're going to be able to see uh, when it's higher or when it's lower. And we're going to be able to make it much more granular. So we're going to be able to say, here's how much water there is, not just for the whole world, but also for individual regions and individual lakes and, re and uh, reservoirs and rivers. One major thrust of the mission is to explore how oceans absorb atmospheric heat and carbon dioxide in a natural process that moderates global temperatures and climate change. This will help scientists learn more about the effects of rising ocean levels on coastal areas, says NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory scientist Ben Hamlington. So, so one of the things SWAT is going to do is it's going to get us closer to the coast than what we've had with other satellite observations. So. Um, a lot of the satellites we have have difficulties measuring in the coastal zone uh, because of the, the type of technology that's used. The radar um, pulses that we typically rely on can get contaminated by land versus ocean. SWAT's going to make a big advance there. It's going to push us closer to the coast and allow us to see that interface, that land-ocean interface, a little more closely and directly. Freshwater bodies are another key focus of SWAT. The satellite is equipped to observe the entire length of nearly all rivers wider than 330 feet, as well as more than 1 million lakes and reservoirs larger than 15 acres. Taking inventory of Earth's water resources will enable researchers to better trace fluctuations in the planet's rivers and lakes during seasonal changes and major weather events. Satellites don't last forever, but three years of data, that's going to tell us what's the state of the planet right now. Right. It's going to give us like three cycles of, you know, uh, winter, spring, summer, fall. And, uh, you know, that'll tell us, yeah, what's what's the state of the planet now? And so as the climate changes and uh, the way we use land and water changes, we'll be able to use that as a baseline to compare against in the future. Mm -hmm.